Hey, welcome to Contra Thoughts. I am Richard, and this is episode 15. Coming right up. Okay, so we've got so much to talk about. There's just there's just so much. This is going to be a shorter video. It's part Peruvian and part Honduran, I think it is. I was running out of the Honduras and I got some Peruvian. It's very good. I like Central American, South, uh, South American coffees the most. That's not what this is about. What this is about is, I was going to read something. Let me just read something real quick. I won't show you exactly who says this just first. But this is from um, an author, a pastor. And um, it's seven statements. These are seven statements from doubters, or, or two doubters, rather. So it says, questions for doubters, as it were. Number one, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be infallible and sufficient guide in all matters of religious faith and practice? Number two, do you believe in the deity as well as the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he himself is God? Note that a man may acknowledge that Christ be divine as he might acknowledge the Bible be divine without admitting that he is God. Number three, do you believe that Christ in his death endured the penalty due to divine justice for human guilt? Note, many admit that he died for us, but excluded the idea of penalty from his death. Number four, do you believe the Holy Spirit to be not only divine influence, but also the true, real, and proper sense of the term, a divine person of God himself? Number five, do you believe that man, do you believe man to have become by sin a fallen creature and have lost by his fall the original peaceful, happy, and holy relations with his maker? Two more. Number six, do you believe that by regeneration, man becomes possessed of a new higher life described as spiritual? That this life is only rendered possible by the mediatorial work of Christ. That is only rendered actual by the work of the Holy Spirit in the soul. And that by a part, and that apart from these means, it can never be enjoyed. And lastly, do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? Resurrection of the dead as an event of the future and not a continual recurrence. Interesting. All right. So, <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all of these because I said this would be a short video. But this is a book, as you can see. So, you can tell it's not new. At least it wasn't like a tweet or something. Because tweets don't make it into books generally. Because they're usually pretty stupid. But, well, it's just across the board, right? But number one is really what I want to look at, and mm, number th four. So we'll hit number four first real quick. Do you believe the Holy Spirit to be not only divine influence, but in true, real, and proper sense, the term a divine person of God? Now, we already uh, know that uh, Dr. Pastor Reverend President Ed Litton had a partialist, weird, non-Trinitarian view of the Trinity, or uh, of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit on his website, which was changed at the convention over a month ago. That's kind of a problem, especially since he doesn't know it. Like, how do you not know what's on your website, or how do you not know what's the the doctrinal statement? Why not just have the Baptist faith and message, or alter it, or whatever? But I guess <laughs> I just learned this recently that someone else said that this doctrinal statement was not even theirs; it was someone else's that they also copyrighted or, or, or counterfeited. They didn't, they, did, they didn't give any attribution. <laughs> like, I, I mean, that's just alone. Like, first of all, the theology's bad, right? The theology's bad. And a lot of people were saying that, especially with the plagiarism stuff and the stealing and the lying and stuff. Like, but the theology's also bad. Anyway, the theology's bad. The, the practice is bad. The reproach on Christ's name is bad. But this is written to questions, questioners, and doubters, people who are doubting something in particular that's going on in the church. Number one, do you believe the scriptures as the 
Old and New Testaments be infallible and sufficient guide for all matters of religious faith and practice. Now that's really the issue, isn't it? Not so much infallibility or inerrancy as it was 40, 50 years ago. Because uh, everybody, oh, I'm an inerrantist. I believe the Bible's inerrant without error, or so on and so forth. That's what that means. But in fact, it's not just that, because that's not really the battle. The battle is the sufficiency. Do we need to use tools? Do we need theories? Do we need uh, critical race theory in particular, or maybe some sort of evolutionary theory or some sort of um, anthropomorphic whatever theory to explain really what humanity is or really what happened at the cross and at the tomb and really what happened with the loaves and the fishes and really what happened when Jesus walked on water and so on. We can do this all the way down the line. We're not just going to say, well, you know, we need to have this pertaining to making distinctions, you know, and now God does care and does show partiality and does care about our skin color or something, which, I mean, he does in the sense that he cares about humanity, which is why he sent Jesus into the world, but he's calling everybody everywhere to repent. So you must repent. You must turn to Christ. And that's, that's the gospel. That's understanding your sin for what it is and repenting of it, saying, I'm not good. It's not God made me this way. No, no, you're fallen. You're in a broken system and you're a broken person rebelling. So you need to not blame the designer. So sufficiency is really where the battle is, not just in the SBC, not just with um, the woke, woke aristas. I heard that <laughs> phrase recently. It's a little much, but um, you know, the people who are more sensitive, I understand their racism is real. I get it. The question is, is it systemic? Is it uh, everywhere? Is everything we know racist or sexist or bigoted or whatever? I mean, people are saying math is racist. And it's like, no, it's not. You're insane. Get out of here. And just, you know, call them insane. Maybe share the gospel with them if you have an opportunity. And then call it a day. Like, we're not, we're not buying this nonsense. I'm not buying this nonsense. And you shouldn't buy this nonsense. So... That's where the battle is. Sufficiency of scripture. Sufficiency. Not inerrancy, not infallibility. Sufficiency. Is the Bible sufficient? Now, of course, it's talking. It's not talking about how to change your oil, right? It's not talking about how to, you know, raise hogs or cattle or something like that, even, even though it could, in some respects, you could have some parallels. Or how to, you know, be a good computer programmer or how to be a good flight attendant or server or whatever. But rather, it has all the principles in there, everything pertaining to life and godliness, right? All scripture is inspired and profitable for, re for correction, reproof, training in righteousness, and so on. Paraphrase. <laughs> but it's sufficient. Now, it doesn't talk about everything. We know that. It doesn't talk about cell phones. Cats aren't mentioned in the Bible. Giraffes aren't mentioned in the Bible, at least not in the New Testament, giraffes and cats. And so that means, well, we don't, there aren't any. That means we can't have them as a pet. That means it doesn't talk about how we should change litter boxes. I mean, that's nonsense. We don't need, no one acts like that. And if you do act like that, quit it because it's nonsense. But rather, we are to do everything unto the Lord. We're to remember that God shows no partiality, that there's no Jew or Greek. We're to remember that God hates sin. We're to remember to put on the spirit and put off the flesh. And they, let's not forget, the New Testament is written <clears throat> overwhelmingly, even the Old Testament is overwhelmingly written, overwhelmingly written to, wait for it, God's people. Covenant people, Old Covenant and then New Covenant, fully realized. It's not written to unbelievers. Now, it doesn't mean unbelievers can't read it. Of course, read the Bible. Everybody. But the letters, especially Paul's letters, are written to believers. Peter, written to believers. Jude, written to believers. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, written to believers. So on and so forth. And so, but we see all this sin, right? The sin of uh, the man having his mother-in-law, right? His dad's wife in Corinth. And Paul blasts him for it, right? The sin of partiality that Peter shows that Paul stands against publicly, where he, he's eaten with these guys, and then these guys show up, the Judaizers show up, the guys who say, you have to be circumcised, and they're like, oh, no, 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 ah, I'm not, I'm not going to hang out with Gentiles, just kidding. And it's like, no, there is no segregation. So all this safe space and all this other craziness of like, oh, you know, we need to segregate again, but like, we use a different term. And that's all the people who are making these claims. The Bible's not sufficient to deal with sex abuse. It's not sufficient to deal with racism. Really? 
Like, since when? Since you've said that, but that's irrelevant. <laughs> because these people, what they're doing is they're putting sociology, they're putting all these things above the scripture, above God's word. And as a Bible believer, as a follower of Christ, you should never do that, ever. It might be hard. It doesn't mean you don't use uh, or, or, or understand certain things. But the scripture should always be what you're looking through. Always. Always. And when it doesn't, it never goes well. Ever. Whenever anybody is pulling other things and saying, well, and they're starting to kind of, you know, maneuver the, the whatever, the theory, the idea, the book, the whatever up on top, the Bible, of course, slows down. I've heard it said like a, a seesaw where you have God up high, man is low, right? God's opinion's high, God's word is high, man's word is low. Well, the seesaw, the teeter-totter, whatever you want to call it, goes the opposite direction. Man goes up and God goes low. You can't really have it both ways. You can't have, well, God's up here, but we're also up here. And of course, who wants to be up there anyway? You're not God. I'm not God. Stop acting like it. Stop acting like you're omniscient. And again, so many people don't say these things, but they act like it. They emphasize. They use these trigger words and this and that. We're talking about spaces. Talking about... Uh, uh, um, all the, they're adopting the words of the world, especially with um, just intersectionality and critical theory and all the rest. So it's pretty mind boggling. But these questions, and I'll, I'll post them um, maybe in the comments. Yeah, or yeah, I'll put in the comments. Do you believe the scriptures? Do you believe the deity of Christ? His death is sub substitutionary atonement that people used to call it divine child abuse, that God killed his son for the sins of the world. Uh, and yet, that's exactly what the text says, right? He was a propitiation, a substitution. For our sins. He became sin on our behalf, that we may become the righteousness of God in him. It's what the Bible says. Now, you might not like it. I understand that. Some people might not like what the Bible says, but don't try and change what the Bible says because it's the Bible and it's kind of the best book of all time and it's been selling, best selling for multiple years, every single year, outpacing every single book, year after year after year after year. And even if it's not, it's still God's word, but I digress. So what is this? This is the downgrade controversy. From 1889, this was written, and this is towards the end of the downgrade controversy, in Charles Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, um, his day in England. Now, he saw much issue with the Baptist Union and much of the things that were going on, mainly with, because get your cultural and historical um, footing, when did Darwin's book come out? 1859, okay? And of course, Darwin and naturalistic evolution and, and materialism and all that stuff had been per percolating for a hundred years or more. You know, this is after the the um, Reformation and the Renaissance, right? And then after the Enlightenment. And once you kind of break away from these things, there's more there's there's more and more freedom, less and less restriction from culture, which is predominantly run by the church, or at least has high influence. You know, Christians are saying, no, God's word is God's word. You should not do that. You should not sin. You should come to church. You should pray and so on and so forth. Even if people aren't doing that, by and large, there was still a conviction of, I should do that. Yeah, that's wrong. But that's being radically lost. You know, 50, 60 years ago, you know, it was still an abomination to get divorced. People would call you out in public if you got divorced, let alone, you know, all the crazy uh, alphabet stuff going on now. Right, just all the madness that's happening now, people murdering their babies left and right and all the rest, uh, and just a divorce like it's no big deal. But 50, 60, 70 years ago, people would call you out if they knew you had gotten divorced. And they would use, say, like Malachi 2. Divorce is an abomination. And so they would use this. But all of that cultural stuff has been washed away, mainly by, not always, but mainly all, almost all of it, but most of it by materialistic evolution uh, taking foot and Darwinian thought. And that's exactly what Spurgeon in this downgrade in talking about it in his day was fighting against. Because you remember, now it's 1889. It really started in the early 1880s. Uh, but it had been, you know, 30, 40 years since the publication. And many people were saying, well, we need to rethink Genesis. 
Maybe the Bible's not sufficient to tell us about our origins, to tell us about who we are. But lest we forget that it's, I mean, that battle's still going on today. It's just not as heated as as the um, critical theory and intersectionality and all the rest is. It's a battle. And most of those people who believe that will also believe in some sort of materialism, which again, let's not forget, we're all an atom and then or the second atom, right? There's either one race or two race. I heard that recently. All an atom or the first atom or the second atom. And of course, that second atom being Jesus himself. But if there is no first atom, how can you have a second atom? I mean, just examine Romans 5 if you don't think it's that important. Paul lays it out. And Adam was a real person. I mean, it's just we see this in Chronicles. We see this in Genesis 5. We see this in Matthew and Luke. Uh, not in Matthew. In Luke, and it's just ubiquitous with the truth that Adam was a real person, there was real sin, there's real substitutionary atonement. But in Spurgeon's day, the downgrade controversy, if you've ever heard that, maybe somebody mentioned it or in church or a class or something like that, that's what it is. He's fighting against the downgrade in theology within his Baptist union, not even the culture. Because the culture, Victorian culture, was very highfalutin, very, very wealthy, very snotty. And this is where Spurgeon preached for 40 plus years, 45 years or so. And so he fighting against the Baptist Union. So I say this to SBC and Big Eva people in general who aren't in the SBC, maybe the PCA or just non-denominational. Are these... Can you answer these truthfully, these seven things? Believe in the scripture being sufficient and infallible. That's really that's really the, the key and probably why it's number one. But the deity of Christ, the divinity of Christ, and so on, it goes down the list. Can you really affirm those things? Can the newly elected presidents or the, the denominational heads or the people who are in charge of the SBC, the PCA, um, I don't know much about the Missouri Synod. I know that's more of the Lutheran, conservative Lutheran group. I know there's other conservative groups out there that actually believe the Bible and so on. But let's not forget that no one lives in a bubble. Everyone is, is, is connected in one way or another. Whether you're on Twitter, whether you're just in the culture, whether you're reading books or newspapers and so on, you're hearing sermons and the like. Everybody's connected in some way or another. So anyway, this has been um, helpful. Spurgeon is amazing in so many ways. You know, he got some stuff wrong. Um, as anybody does, but he is a light, and um, I commend him to you. He's very good. He's, I would, I, I'm saying this now to again the the power brokers and the elites of Big Eva. Can you affirm these things? Are you really going to stand here and tell me that the Bible's sufficient? Yet we still need these other things. Yet, well, I mean, yeah, Christ is sufficient, but you know, he substitutes. Well, but you still should say sorry for your racism, even though you're not racist. But it's based on the color of your skin. Uh, I mean, it's just antithetical, this grievance and constant struggle, this constant fight, which is exactly materialistic Darwinism, which is exactly what Spurgeon was fighting against um, in his church of his day. He was fighting against it because it was coming into the church and they're rewriting Genesis, rewriting much of the Old Testament. Again, people do that today and they were wrong then, they're wrong now. Uh, just take the Bible what it says. It's far easier and your life goes far better and I mean, it's God's word. It's pretty easy. It might be ridiculed. You might be made fun of. I understand that. But even still, even if you accept all of the, say, Darwinian thought, and, well, maybe Adam wasn't a real person, and this and this and this. Maybe, yeah, maybe in billions of years. Maybe this, maybe. Even if that's all the case, even if you think that's all the case, the problem is, the problem is, if you still believe that, say, I don't know, Jesus made fish and bread from nothing, which then some people start denying that too. Or there was a global flood. Well, global judgment. I don't know. It sounds kind of icky. Okay, deny that, deny this, deny that. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Because if you don't, you're not saved. I mean, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So forget all those lordship, anti-lordship salvation people. I don't even understand that debate. I have to do some research on that. Uh, it's been raging for like years now. People are like, I'm Jesus is my savior, but not my Lord. Like maybe drop in the comments and explain it or send me some links or something because I, Jesus, Lord Jesus, it's kurios. It's the same word for Yahweh in the Old Testament. Like it's pretty straightforward. Jesus is Lord. But anyway, 
If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're saved. So even if you believe, don't believe any of that other, you know, Sunday school stuff, like, well, I'm not 10 anymore. I don't believe in a global flood and Adam and Eve and the fig leaves. and eh, It's just a little weird. It's not really scientific. Okay, that's fine. I mean, it's not fine, but you know what I mean. So good. It's getting a little cold, though. It's been like 20 minutes. Even if you don't believe those things, you're not going to get any cred with Richard Dawkins' sidekicks and his devotees or Bill Maher and his friends. You're just not because you still say Jesus rose from the dead. Unless you say Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then guess what? Ding, ding, ding. You're not a Christian, which we're seeing a lot of people now sadly deconstruct either their pop famous guys and they're deconstructing, which is sad and terrible, but they were never really of us. They were never really in the faith to begin with. They were deceived, sadly. Or they're in some sort of wicked sin and perhaps they'll come back. Hopefully they will. Or, or worse than the, the deconstruction, is that people are just swallowing hook, line, and sinker, sinker and saying, well, I'm not an evangelical. I'm a this now. And I'm going to embrace my sexuality. I'm going to embrace these things. I'm going to embrace this political candidate and so on. And that's not any better. And oh, lo and behold, look at all their denials of all these other things along the way. It's a slippery slope. I understand that. It really is. And, you know, sometimes people will mock, oh, that's a slippery slope argument. That won't happen, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, but look at look at the fruit of it. If you want to call it something else, I don't care. Call it a, you know, a wet mountain. I don't, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Slippery slope sounds good because it's alliteration. But look at how people live their lives. If you don't, if you don't put Jesus as Lord first, and if you're seeking to live for him first, and all the nuances that that goes in, all the people that you talk to, if you're not kind to people and gentle with your family or with your parents or your children or grandchildren, if you're not seeking to do what is right all the time, and when you stumble, you acknowledge that sin, keeping a short leash on your sin, that sin is going to come in. The scripture calls it, it's crouching at the door, waiting to devour you like a raging lion. Sin is not something to mess with. It really isn't. And we see more and more of these people, whether it's, you know, again, plagiarism and lying and stealing and all that. That's the current moment. But, you know, it was something else six months ago and it'll be something else six months from now. And as Christians, we must seek to keep a short leash on our sin, a short leash on what we're doing. Because ultimately, if we don't, it will eat us away like cancer. So it was a long closing statement, but this is a good book. It's like I said, it's the downgrade controversy, Charles Spurgeon. And um, yeah, he's great. His sermons are great. You can't really get any on recording because it was before recording He when he preached, but wonderful books. He's got a lot of stuff on the Holy Spirit and prayer and so on. So if you've not heard about Charles Spurgeon, he's amazing. Uh, check him out. And uh, until next time, don't forget to be against the world for the sake of the world. I hope that's what you're seeing here, um, both in this video and others. Go ahead and check out some of my other videos, uh, the last episode uh, about Ed Litton. And uh, we've got, I've got some more Contra Talks coming up, so keep your eyes out for that. So go ahead and like and subscribe. And uh, drop a comment. I'd really appreciate it. It does help the thing that starts with A and ends with M. And uh, yeah, that's it. Till next time, take care. Hey, welcome to Contra Thoughts. I'm gonna look right at the camera. Hey, welcome to Contra Thoughts. My name, Contra Thoughts. I, why don't I ever remember it? Talk is the talk show. Why don't I never remember it? I don't know. All right, we're still rolling, we're still rolling. Uh,